So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the uh, IEEE EMBS webinar series on the uh, frontiers of uh, biomedical imaging and analysis. Uh, my name is Ping Kun Yan. I'm an assistant professor at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm co-hosting this webinar with uh, professors Ahmed Kaskin, uh, Professor uh, Marlene uh, De Bruni, and uh, uh, Professor Maria Singuraru. So we are all part of the IEEE BIIP technical committee. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Marlene De Bruni to introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much, Bing Kun, and uh, thank you and uh, Ahmed for taking the lead in organizing these exciting webinar series. It is a great pleasure to present today's speaker, uh, Professor Stephanie Speidel. Professor Speidel is a professor at the National Center for Tumor Diseases in Dresden, where, uh, Germany, where she heads the Department of Translational Surgical Oncology. She is investigating the entire process chain of surgical treatment, including pre, intra and post-operative patient information, uh, with contributions in surgical workflow analysis, uh, soft tissue navigation and intraoperative visualization, and also in surgical training and surgical data science. We are very excited to have her uh, present some of her research today. And Stephanie, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks Marlene for the very kind introduction and also for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to speak today. I'm uh, sharing my screen now. So, you will see my slides. And um, so I will talk today about uh, AI assisted surgery. But before I want to take you to an excursion to the National Center for Tumor Diseases in, in Dresden, it's directly located at the University Clinic campus. You can see here the building and uh, it combines a patient therapy and research under one roof. So there is an exceptional infrastructure. So for example, uh, several imaging platforms, um, but also an experimental OR where our research takes place, um, where we work in close collaborations with um, the surgeon on different um, surgical needs. Um, so basically surgical data science um, applied to various assistance systems that are needed during surgery to improve um, patient therapy. So, um, my group, it's an interdisciplinary group. I'm a computer scientist by training and, um, uh, yeah, a lot of my um, researchers are computer scientists, electrical engineers, but also surgeons. And um, basically, we are working on computer and robot assisted surgery topics. And I will show you in, in the next um, 30 minutes some of them. So, but let me start with some numbers that you might not be aware of. So, um, post-operative complications are amongst the leading causes of this. So, there's a recent Lancet comment that shows that. Um, so, approximately 4.2 million die worldwide within the 30 days of surgery. And uh, a lot of uh, this is related to surgical error. So the challenge we face here is how can we take computer and robot assisted surgery to the next level to enhance um, these uh, surgeries and to reduce complications by using artificial intelligence or cognitive assistance function. And you can see here a typical um, cycle uh, we, we have here, we perceive data, um, mostly sensor data in the OR. We do a knowledge-based interpretation and then provide some kind of real-time assistance. And um, if you take a closer look at what is needed to perform surgery, so-called surgical skills, it's not only about uh, manual dexterity. Um, so surgery is is quite complex. It's not only the surgeon, it's a, it's the whole team um, who is performing the surgery. And you have to have a kind of situation awareness, um, you have to have leadership skills, um, and it's about fast decision making, and it involves uh, teamwork, um, because as I said, it's a whole team in the OR. And it's not surprisingly that the outcome depends 
uh, a lot on the experience of the team. And um, here you can see a famous study. Um, there are a lot of studies that show that. Um, there are two complex cancer surgeries, esophagectomy and pancreatic resection. And you can see the mortality related to how often this kind of surgery is performed in the center. And um, these numbers show that uh, the more often this kind of surgery is performed, the lower is the mortality. And I mean, that, that's not a surprise, but there are also uh, studies that uh, quantify that. So the question we face here is how can we quantify this experience and make it accessible to machines? and to democratize the skill uh, a surgeon or a surgical team has. And this leads me to the topic of surgical data science. This is an initiative that uh, I co-founded in uh, 2016. It involves already 51 institutions worldwide. And um, the objective is to improve the quality of interventional healthcare by capturing, organizing, analyzing, and modeling of data. So in this diagram on the right, you can see that at present we have a, a surgical team or a surgeon and a lot of devices in the OR. And um, the surgeon has kind of domain knowledge. So for example, recent studies that were published, uh, case knowledge, um, which involves the experience. And then you have the patient individual data. But um, what is, uh, envision in the future is an interconnected operating room. So where have, you have the devices, you can analyze online, um, and you can connect it to the domain knowledge, the case knowledge, and to the patient individual data you have before uh, surgery. So this leads me to the term sensor OR, which is this interconnected environment. So you can uh, see these devices in this uh, scenario as sensors and a robot, for example, is also a, a sensor and an actor at the same time. And our vision is that we can analyze this data in real time and provide the right assistance um, at the right moment. And I will show you now some examples um, that we are working on along these lines of surgical data science. And I will start with data generation. Um, and right now, this is one of the major bottlenecks we face because for training uh, machine learning methods or in particular deep learning methods, we need a lot of data. And um, then I will show you an example in the context of data analysis. It's um, soft tissue uh, navigation, um, then uh, to integrate the assistance in the whole workflow, it has to have some, some kind of context awareness and to enable an intuitive human machine collaboration. Um, I will show you an example in that area. And then in the end, all the methods I show you can also be applied to surgical training, because I think this is a really important topic because poor skill in the end harms patients. And um, there is also a lot of potential to enhance surgical training by using surgical data science methods. So I will start now with uh, the data generation part. And um, so as I already said, um, we need annotated data. And with data, I mean here uh, in particular uh, laparoscopic videos. So um, you can imagine a surgery lasts several hours. Um, we have uh, videos, but we have also in addition device data. And this data has to be annotated. Um, and this often requires expert knowledge. So for example, the expert knowledge is not needed when it comes to instruments. As you can see here on the left, I can also annotate instruments, but it's getting more and more tricky if it comes to annotating, for example, blood puddles. So there's the question, when is a bleeding critical and when not? And, um, and this is something, uh, for example, where to dissect uh, in a quite complex surgery. And this all requires expert knowledge. And um, as you know, surgeons, they don't have time in clinical routine. So we need to come up with, with some kind of strategies, for example, to speed up the annotation process or to generate synthetic data. Um, 
And the idea here was to, to use recent advances in unpaired image to image translation to generate realistic synthetic data. So normally the um, yeah, images you can create based on simulations, as you can see here on the left, they don't look realistic. Um, but uh, unpaired image to image translation um, makes it possible to texture this scene to look more realistic and to use this as uh, training data because if it is based on a simulation, we exactly know uh, the ground truth and, for example, where which tissue type is and where which kind of instrument. And um, so the idea here is uh, we use a simple uh, simulation of an abdominal 3D scene. So here we exactly know the uh, camera pose and uh, we then we use a, a simple rendering based on a simple lighting model and we get a scene like that. And if we want to um, use it extra it now, we use an, uh, for example, um, unit uh, approach. It's an uh, cycle consistent image translation and you get a scene then here like that on the right. We also um, in Incorporate a multimodal image to image translation to increase the diversity in the final data set and also a structural similarity loss, which has the ad advantage that um, this preserves the structure of the whole scene independent of the camera viewpoint um, while not adding too much details to the scene. So you, you can see here some examples of the translation results. So on the left, uh, the simple rendering and here different styles of um, texturing um, and the structure and the content are preserved due to the um, structural similarity loss. And um, the, the data and the code is available online. So if you're working in this field, you could use it, for example, um, as pre-training um, your networks. It has different translation styles and we also provide the labels for example for uh, semantic segmentation or for death images if you work on 3d reconstruction and so on so the next question was how can we translate this to videos because uh, we have laparoscopic videos usually and not only um, still images and um, if we use this approach directly, the image to image translation, we have a problem because it's not view consistent. You can see here an, ex an example. So look at the background, you see that uh, the background is flickering. There are a lot of different textures and um, this means that we cannot use this approach directly and, and translate it to uh, videos. So um, the idea was now that if we have to simulate it 3D scene, we exactly know the camera pose and the trajectory. And um, then we can use a neural rendering approach to learn the global texture representation. So this way, the information can be stored in a 3D texture, texture space and can be used by the translation module from different viewpoints. And the translation module is still an M unit. So um, you can see here then. The, uh, the result, if we use a neural rendering approach and um, it preserves a few consistency. So look at the background again, if you compare it to the example before, you see that it's a uh, few consistent even in, in longer video sequences. And um, to give you a bit more details um, about the approach, so the core is uh, still an unpaired uh, image to image translation. So based on unit, as you can see here on top, but the new model is a global learnable texture of the entire scene. So if we render the current view, we use a simple rendering um, as in the example before, and then we project the texture features into the image plane. And this serves as input to our translation module. And since the projection is differentiable, it uh, can be learned end to end. Um, and the model can store the information on texture in 3D space. So for example, the location of vessels or the color of the liver. And um, to 
for a few consistency, we render a second few. And we warp then the first few into the second few and uh, this and enforce Deborah a pixel-wise consistency. Um, since the light source in laparoscopy is constantly moving, um, we also propose a lightning invariant um, loss. Um, and also important to note is that the data is not paired. So um, we only use simulated 3D scenes and then unconstrained collections of, uh, of real images to make this work. Okay, and here you can see some results. Um, so here we, with, with our approach, this is the simple approach I showed you at the beginning. So you can see here a few consistency is a problem, but here it is preserved. And here we can generate all different kinds of um, uh, video uh, scenes um, and uh, use it for, for uh, training data. And we, for every frame, we exactly know the annotation. Okay, the next example I want to show you is uh, in the context of data analysis and more specifically soft tissue registration. I guess you all know the problem of soft tissue registration. Um, so we have pre-operative patient data, as you can see here on the right, um, we have a patient uh, with a tumor in the liver here in yellow, and uh, based on the CT images, we can build a 3D model, but the intraoperative scene looks like that. So if it's done uh, laparoscopically, you have an, uh, a laparoscope, and um, this is the, the view of the laparoscope. And um, if you, you have to have some experience um, to have a mental model of this 3D model and project it into this uh, scene. So the challenge here is how can we use this pre-operative data to provide an augmented reality visualization? And since it's soft tissue, it's constantly moving. And um, so here you can see a, a picture, uh, how it looks uh, inside the features. So if you work in computer vision, you see, okay, th this data is, very noisy. We have only sparse correspondences uh, regarding the pre and intraoperative model. And then what's more challenging is um, that we don't know the boundary conditions um, and we have unseen boundaries, which is invisible. So classically, you could use a finite element method so to uh, in model the mechanical behavior of the tissue. And um, if you know the parameters, um, that, that's a very good and accurate approach, but often it's really difficult to parameterize and also you have to deal with unknown boundaries. Um, so, and you don't find any literature about it or the literature is very contradicting um, regarding uh, these parameters. So we thought, can we learn this somehow um, to, to learn the tissue deformation and directly learn to match the surfaces and also to deal with different input modalities. And um, there we came up with a data-driven biomechanical model. And the idea here is um, we have uh, our pre-operative model, as you can see here in gray, and we have our intraoperative model, which we reconstruct from the stereo laparoscope. I will uh, show you a bit more details um, in the next slides how we reconstruct it. And then the challenge is to, re to register both geometries. And um, therefore, we use a volume to surface registration network. And the output of this network is the displacement field in real time. And then we use it to uh, align the in pre and intraoperative geometry. And um, important to notice it that it works directly on the geometry. So we don't need to find correspondences. And um, we trained it on random simulations. Um, so to train this network, again, we need a lot of training data. We don't have uh, training data from real surgeries. So we thought, okay, uh, can we use random simulations? And um, also important to know is that it adapts directly to new patient geometry. So we don't have to feed in the, the patient geometry um, in advance. 
So let me show you a bit more about the synthetic training data. As I said, we generated organ-like meshes, not exactly livers, but any organ-like mesh. And um, this is our pre-operative state. Then we added random boundary condition and put it into an, a simulation, an FEM simulation. And this is then our intraoperative deformed state. And then we can also extract a partial surface, which serves as the laparoscopic surface. And um, then we have a signed distance field of the um, the pre-operative state and the partial surface. And um, this is the input to our network and the output is then a displacement field. Um, and we did this for 80,000 uh, meshes and this is our training data. So we did a lot of experiments and in silico experiments. So you can see here in yellow, this is the partial surface. And um, if we put uh, the pre-operative state and the partial surface into our network, it gives a quite accurate estimation, but um, there are also uh, yeah, exceptions when it fails. So for example, if the partial surface is too small, so we need at least 20%, and uh, also if the rotation is too large um, of the pre- and intraoperative uh, state, then uh, it does not work. And um, we also did an inhuman uh, CT breathing motion experiment where we use landmarks and um, it uh, we could reduce the displacement error to um, 5.7 millimeters with the network. And um, for intraoperative data, we only control that it works uh, qualitatively because it's really very difficult to, to get the ground truth there. But in general, it works if the rotation is not too large, but still there are uh, challenges we face right now. So for example, um, as I said, if, if the deformation is too large or if the tissue is cut, this is not incorporated yet. <clears throat> so um, I also wanted to uh, give a bit more detail about the intraoperative model and here we use uh, the laparoscope and it's a classical stereo reconstruction approach. So you can use the left and the right uh, camera and perform a stereo reconstruction in real time, as you can see here. And um, here you can see uh, real patient data from the recorded with the Da Vinci. And we do not only reconstruct the, the 3D scene, but we also um, estimate the pose of the laparoscope because in the end we need also to know where the laparoscope is if we want to use an augmented reality visualization. <clears throat> so here you can see um, the whole pipeline. Uh, we we want to um, bring it uh, into the OR, um, and hopefully we can do this beginning of next year. So this is still a phantom experiment. Um, so we acquire the intraoperative model and um, <coughs> by using the the laparoscope. And um, we also estimate the camera pose. Um, you can see the 3D model of the intraoperative su surface. And at first we do a rigid alignment. Um, and this is done uh, semi-automatically. So the surgeon just has to click on, um, on three um, landmarks. Um, and this does not have to be accurate. Um, and this is performed then as, uh, as the first registration step, a rigid alignment. And um, the rigid alignment is not accurate um, enough. And um, as you can see here in the next seconds, and uh, therefore we use then the, um, the soft tissue registration or our uh, network I showed you in the previous slide. <clears throat> So you all know that translating into uh, clinical uh, routine um, involves a lot of engineering problems regarding uh, accuracy and performance and so on. So this is uh, a challenge we are facing right now. And so in the end, it, it should look like that. So you can see here from, from the Da Vinci um, some, some examples and uh, also here on, on the Phantom.
Okay, so the next example is uh, in the context or uh, is context awareness. And um, here I want, first I want to uh, define what means context awareness. So uh, we want to provide the right information at the right time. So a computer or a robot has to know um, in which phase, for example, the searcher is and what information is needed in this phase. So here you can see an example um, where we estimate the remaining time of the surgery. It's uh, more focused on OR workflow management. So the system detects the phase we are uh, in right now, uh, performing the surgery, and estimates then the remi remaining time. And um, here we use uh, videos uh, which are annotated regarding uh, phases. And um, then we use a Bayesian neural network, um, which also incorporates uncertainty we, we have uh, with our prediction uh, regarding the remaining time. <clears throat> so another thing regarding context awareness we are working on is anticipation of events. Um, and this is necessary, for example, to have an intuitive human machine collaboration. So if you if you want to have a scrub nurse, for example, as a robot, or if you want to have a, a robot that does blood suction, for example, so any kind of event can, can be anticipated. And here um, we show you an example, uh, the anticipation of instrument. So um, we formulated it as a joint um, regression and classification problem. So to predict the time until the occurrence uh, of an instrument, um, and whether or not an instrument will appear within a different um, time horizon. And for training, we only require labels for events we want to anticipate in this uh, example, the instruments. And for inference, we need only raw video data. And um, then we use a Bayesian deep learning framework um, to also account for uncertainty. Um, associated with these future events. And um, we showed that we can identify so-called trigger events, um, which trigger the usage of instruments through uncertainty quantification. So here you can see an example uh, of the CISAR. So we could show that the network identifies the uh, placing of clips as a trigger event for cutting. And this means that the CISAR uh, is anticipated instrument in a defined uh, time horizon of uh, three minutes. And you can show here that the uncertainty decreases. And um, this can be used for pr predicting um, the instrument usage. I mean, in the end, we do not only want to predict instrument usage, but also complications, for example, um, and to give advice uh, if, if a complication occurs but uh, therefore we need uh, much more training data. <clears throat> so here you can see an example of um, the, uh, the experimental OR and how it's integrated, for example, in the Da Vinci system. It's a tumor operation, it's a resection, and um, here we use lots of of, of data annotated by uh, surgeons. In, in this kind of three video data, they annotate the different tissue types and um, phases and what kind of complications can occur. And then this is shown, for example, in, in the video directly to the surgeon. Um, so you can see here um, what the surgeon sees. It's not only the face, but also, um, for example, where to cut. This is a, a, a delicate phase at the beginning. And um, here we, we used expert annotations on, on cutting. Um, and this is directly overlaid in the, in the video scene or, or later on where uh, delicate structures um, are. I was always on the phone. So for example, here. Um, which should not be uh, in. 
Um, so again, an example of a demonstrator where the laparoscope is mounted um, on a robot arm. And um, here we also learned how to steer the laparoscope depending on the face. So we recorded uh, experts performing um, a kind of demonstration surgery. And then um, we, uh, we annotated it. Um, and uh, depending on the viewpoint, if it's a good viewpoint or not. And um, the robot learns then how to steer the laparoscope depending on the face. And we also visualize, for example, risk and target structures. Um, so as I said, this, this is done on a demonstrator, um, but <coughs> we are also working on translating this to a more realistic scenario. Okay. I want to conclude with another example on surgical training. And um, as I said in the beginning, this is an important area because poor skill harms patients in the end. And um, normally surgeons, they or um, novices, they practice on a so-called POP trainer. As you can see here, it's a, a simple training system which mimics the laparoscopic instruments and and uh, the um, laparoscopic view, and normally an expert is beneath and gives advice. But this does not scale very well because experts they don't have time and um, they, the novices, they want feedback. So we thought about how can we enhance this training system? So for example, by incorporating different kinds of sensors, um, uh, so uh, sensors regarding um, haptic feedback and uh, sensors uh, regarding uh, the trajectory of the instruments and also eye tracking, for example. And um, then we recorded uh, novices and experts. Um, and, and we did a lot of data collection and annotation. Uh, hopefully this is published soon. And using computer vision, you can analyze the scene. So you can see here, uh, a, a simple um, analysis where we exactly know where is which instrument and uh, what kind of object is picked up. It's a, it's a simple pick and place operation. And then in the end, we want to estimate the performance or assess the performance. And this is usually done by using standard uh, scales um, regarding instrument dexterity or tissue handling. So these are, are standard scales that are used in, in surgery to learn surgical uh, or minimally invasive skills. And um, we annotated the data regarding um, the, the skills, and then we can use it to assess the performance. And then in the end, to give also feedback. Um, and We used here to um, assess the, uh, the skill performance, a 3D CNN approach. Um, so 3D CNNs are good to extract spatiotemporal features. And the goal here was to predict the skill level and the class. So you can see here the famous jigsaw data set we used, um, and we have uh, novices, intermediate and expert in this data set. And the problem with 3D CNNs is that they can only process a small number of video frames. Um, and uh, therefore, the idea was that we split the video into smaller snippets. Um, and then we have all the snippets, and um, we can use the 3D CNN to classify each snippet as novice, intermediate, or uh, expert, as you can see here. And then in the end, we can aggregate the result, um, which then we can use to, to obtain the, the skill class for the video. But the question is, how can we train this 3D CNN? So basically, you would uh, put the video snippets through the CD CNN and compare the obtained um, class score with a ground truth skill label and then back propagate the error. Um, but however, we only did this is a video that lasts um, longer than the snippets, and we only have one skill label. But we saw that not every snippet has the same skill label or because it, it is performed by an intermediate or a novice does not mean that every snippet is performed in a, in a bad way. Um, 
so to so there may be certain overlap to expert performances. And to, to get around this, we extended the 3D CNN into a temporal segment network. And now we look at several video snippets sampled throughout the video, and we use a Siamese architecture to classify all the snippets at once in the end and then get the skill label. So um, here I also want to, to highlight a bit uh, a work that we do in cooperation um, with a mechanical engineering in, in the context of our uh, excellence cluster at CETI. And this um, relates to how can we give feedback then um, during a performance. And they designed an, a haptic uh, instrument where we have here this pulsating ring and um, the idea here is if an instrument gets out of the view which is happens often uh, for novices um then the the ring pulsates and directs it in the in the direction um, the instrument should um should be uh, looking at so um in this video, you, you can see how this uh, this is integrated in the demonstrator. Um, so here is the training system. It's a top trainer with different sensors integrated to computer vision analysis, as you can see here. And um, if the instrument, uh, if the performance is compared with, with parts, and if the instrument gets out of the scene, then um, the, um, the haptic or the pulsating Bring, uh, I give a hint how to, to get back to the scene. So in the end, I want to um, yeah, show some remaining challenges, and there are a lot of remaining challenges um, to tackle the translation from bench to bedside. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, one challenge is related to data. So how can we get access to annotated data? And this is currently one of the major bottlenecks we face for surgical data science, because as I said, we have videos that last several hours of complex procedures. There's a high variance depending on, on the hospital and the patient. And um, then you have to look uh, if the data is representative for the task uh, you want to solve and uh, what kind of bias is involved. Um, and then you have the problem of uh, data security and patient protection and so on. So um, so I, I believe that this can be tackled by several complementary approaches. So for example, to you can reduce the annotation effort by using crowdsourcing or active learning. Um, but you can also generate synthetic data sets. I showed you one example or um, methods such as self-supervised learning. And um, regarding uh, patient or data protection, I think federated learning um, um, is something that could be used to tackle this problem. So where the data um, or the models are uh, going to the data and not vice versa. And um, then uh, methods, it, it's another challenge. Um, so how can we deal with, with unlabeled or weakly labeled data we often have in surgical data science? Um, how can we ensure generalization? Because a method uh, works in one center or hospital does not mean that it works in, in other centers. So, uh, so we need multi-center uh, data and uh, to, to also account for the variability we have in these procedures. Um, then we have quite heterogeneous data sources. I showed you a lot uh, in the context of uh, surgical videos, but we have also additional device data or trajectories from the robot and so on. And um, how can we also model the different actors? Uh, we do not only have search, as, as I said, we have a whole team in the OR. So these are challenges we face here. To mention a few, then um, the medical devices are, are a challenge for itself. I mean, I showed you at the beginning the sensor OR, and um, a prerequisite to analyze the data is that we have access to the to the data or to the interfaces, and the um, companies have to 
provide this. Uh, so we can only access this if we have a cooperation um, with, with, with industry. And then integration is also a challenge because an assistance system will not be used if it's not integrated into the surgical workflow somehow. And um, there I showed you the idea of, of context awareness, for example, as, as one way to integrate it into the surgical workflow in, in the whole OR setting. So um, I want to conclude with, with the vision of the OR of the future, with, which is a sensor connected environment um, where we can have access to the data in real time and provide the right assistance at the right time. This might be a context aware visualization or a robotic camera guidance, or we can predict uh, the remaining time or even complications if we have uh, the data. So in the end, I want to thank uh, my PhDs and postdocs and my group who is actually doing the work I presented here and um, my cooperation partners uh, and my, uh, my funding and uh, the um, excellence cluster at CETI and the Else Gruner for the News um, Center for Digital Health. And uh, you for your attention. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful talk. Um, now we can actually hand it to uh, Ahmed for question and answering. Sure. Uh, let me see if there is a chat question here. Um, okay, if not, uh, quick question from my side um, is, uh, so the virtual reality and in combination with the beautiful work that you have shown, uh, could you guys help us understand where where we are heading? Can we combine the two? And uh, uh, you mean the the virtual reality or the virtual virtual reality? Yeah, the head displays and how you combine these deep learning methods. Um. So, um, for the visualization de devices itself, um, I, I think right now there there is. For augmented reality, there is not a device yet um, that uh, fulfills all requirements we need for, for the OR. So, for example, the HoloLens, it, um, it's quite bulky and it's difficult to wear. And um, yeah, I, I think we are not there yet. Hopefully, there will be some new devices um, coming out uh, soon um, that, may, that are easier to use. And um, in in general, um, the yeah the we still have to face the registra registration problem um, because we have all, all this deforming tissue, and um, this is this is quite challenging right now because I, I showed you this example of the liver, but once the liver is cut, we we have a completely different situation. Great, thank you. And I think we have a question from Abbas Chedat. Have you addressed the issue of ethical AI in the case when the AI model suggests, recommends any cut region? For example, that turns out to be a bad, uh, let me scroll down, bad choice later on. Who will be responsible, the surgeon or the AI model? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because uh, my video somehow freezed. Um, so um, I, I think that that's important uh, to incorporate some kind of um, ethical uh, AI, as you call it. Um, for example, there is at uh, um, at Harvard there is uh, um, a, the Bergman Klein Center, and they proposed a principled AI and uh, to to have different concepts um, regarding uh, this. And in the end, this is not solved yet. Who is responsible? Um, and this is not only faced in surgery, but in all different kinds of application domains, for example, also in autonomous driving. So um, I, I think this this is a problem that, that is not solved yet. But in the end, we do not want to replace the surgeon um, because uh, this is the one who, who is deciding in the end. Um, and it, to, to give some some advices, but um, we don't want to automate uh, the, the whole procedure. Great. 
then <clears throat> we have another question that's not complete uh, from Salo, but it, uh, it asks about the images must adapt to patient geometry. I think there will be more questions, but I think it's <laughs> cut there. Do you have any comments about the patient geometry to the adapting to the images? Um, or, or we can wait for the full question if, yeah, we can maybe wait for the full, full question if you like. Can you still hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> because <laughs> it seems the the Webex breathed uh, in my um, on my screen, so hopefully um, uh, it will stay like that. Um, so the the soft tissue registration I showed you was completely trained on random simulations of organ-like meshes, and um, we now have. Oops. Oops, looks like we uh, lost uh, Dr. Spedal. Um, yeah, I hope she can um, rejoin. I'll stop recording for now.